Hi folks, welcome to lecture number 10 where we're going to kind of finish up the severe storm component to severe weather here. In the next couple of lectures we'll get into the tropical systems. Today we're going to get into the MCCs or the mesoscale convective complex, an area that we had to skip or, or push back a little bit from the first six lectures. We'll do that. Then I want to do a little case study, show you a, a tornado event that occurred down here in the south. And then we'll kind of recap the last though, nine lectures or so very, very quickly. And we'll wrap up this portion of the tapes and get ready for uh, tropical systems coming up. So, with that then, I want to jump right into the MCC, or the Mesoscale Convective Complex. What the Mesoscale Convective Complex is, is it is a large, organized complex of multi-cell storms that has to meet some criteria, and that criteria is defined by IR satellite imagery. There's also a temporal component to this criteria, and I'll show you that in a second. The genesis region, or where the majority of MCCs uh, begin, is considered the high plains of the United States, places like eastern Wyoming, northern Nebraska, southern South Dakota. However, really MCCs can take place anywhere east of the Rocky Mountains. It doesn't necessarily mean they're only a high plains or a midwestern type of uh, storm system. We get these things down here in the southeast as well. Here are the criteria that you need to be familiar with uh, that are associated with defining something as an MCC. Now these things are, are, are really quite large in size. Think about them as being about the size of the state of Iowa in terms of their cloud, cloud coverage. But the cloud shield has to be continuous low IR temperatures of at least minus 32 C and it must have an area of at least 100,000 square kilometers. The second thing is you need an interior colder cloud region with temperatures of at least minus 52 degrees C and that area must have uh, an, an aerial extent of 50,000 square kilometers. The duration of the size, you have to have uh, the size A, that 100,000 area and size B, the 50,000 kilometer area, must be met for a period of at least six hours. And the shape of an MCC suggests that the ratio of the minor axis to the major axis has to be 0.7 to 1 at the time of maximum extent. Basically it means these things have to be almost circular in size. And the maximum extent is the area that the cold uh, cloud region, those minus 32 degrees, reaches. How, how expansive does that become? Here is what an MCC looks like. Again, defined by IR imagery, here is your minus 32 degree area. And again, this has to be at least 100,000 square kilometers. Here's your minus 52 degree area here. This is enhanced IR imagery that we're looking at. And that has to be at least 50,000 square kilometers. Okay, so you can see these things are enormous. If this, if you scooted this over to the east a little bit, it would almost be the size of Missouri in this case. And what's going on in here is that you have embedded a number of thunderstorms. This is a multi-cell thunderstorm type of a complex. It is defined, however, by that overall larger IR uh, imagery. Okay, it's defined by the cloud shield that all those thunderstorms produce together. Again, the ratio of the long axis to the small axis should be 0.7 to uh, 1, so it needs to be nearly circular, uh, a little bit oblong in shape, in this case right through here. But again, uh, it, it can't be, what they're trying to suggest is this is not a squall line. This is not some linear feature um, that we're looking at here. This is its own well-defined cluster of thunderstorms. The typical MCC, or mesoscale convective complex, develops from a cluster of storms which initiate in a region of mid-level warm air advection. Most often, uh, the elevated surfaces just east of the Rocky Mountains are a great initiation point. Storms typically initiate in the early evening. So you get heating of the uh, eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Since they are, you know, vegetation sparse, they heat up quite efficiently. You get rising air parcels that are heated in response to that heated surface that begin to rise and you can get a small cluster of storms that begins to form in the early evening. Through the condensation process, as we're releasing uh, 
the latent instability. The mid-levels of the atmosphere are warmed. Uh, the mid-level warming results in a meso-low, which acts to tighten the low-level pressure gradient, thereby enhancing the low-level jet. So now, what we're getting at here is we get this meso-low that forms because we do have a rather large cluster of storms that has initiated late in the afternoon. So we get this low at the mid-levels, which helps to enhance or pull the low-level jet uh, into those storms. The low-level jet feeds the complex of storms. The low-level jet itself often generates in response to differential surface heating or cooling along the eastern slopes of the Rockies as well. This is just the opposite of how the storms begin or be get initiated. They initiate from heating of the Rocky Mountains, okay, that gets the air rising. The low-level jet actually forms from the cooling of the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And you get that cool air that sinks it bends down the surfaces of your height lines, and you actually get a pressure gradient force, or you get an easterly component to the winds. Coriolis kicks in and turns that to a more northerly component to the winds, and that helps feed the storms. Now, as this nocturnal development or this late evening development of the low-level jet, the peak time for mesoscale convective complex is around 1 to 3 a.m and the decay stage takes place around dawn. Uh, some mesoscale convective complexes have survived for a couple of days. As long as they maintain a pressure gradient for the mid-level inflow, and the mid-level inflow remains warm and moist. Okay, let's go to the overhead camera if we can, and I'm gonna draw a couple of things here to kind of recap what we, just, what we just talked about with the slides. So, first and foremost, here are the Rocky Mountains, okay? And we're down the spine of the Rocky Mountains. And so during the day, and it doesn't have to be that these storms don't have to always initiate along the Rocky Mountains. They can initiate essentially anywhere east of the Rockies. But generally, one of the preferred areas of, of uh, initiation is in the high plains. You get a tremendous amount of heating because, again, you have a, a relatively non-vegetated surface. And so what you get is you get air parcels that are going to want to rise along the eastern slopes in the high plains of the Rockies, and you get the formation of thunderstorms, okay? Now, something needs to help these thunderstorms sustain themselves. One of those things is the process of this cluster of thunderstorms itself providing uh, a mid-level low, so to speak, that helps pull in the low-level air. Well, during the evening time, we get cold air drainage off of these Rocky Mountains. As the sun goes across the Rocky Mountains and we begin to cast a shadow along the eastern slopes, they begin to cool quite efficiently. Again, there's a lack of moisture here. So what you get then is a colder air that drains down the eastern slopes of the Rockies. And so early in the day, you might have height lines that look like this. Okay, They're nice and stratified in the atmosphere. Let's just say that this is 1,000, this is 925, this is 850 millibars. So we begin to drain down cold air from the Rocky Mountains. And what happens then over time is because the thickness of the atmosphere is determined by the mean temperature of that layer of the atmosphere, what happens is these height lines begin to bend down into that cold air where that cold air is. The thicknesses decrease, okay? Which means in the horizontal, we have now set up a pressure gradient force. If this is 925, this middle line again, and we go across here horizontally, we might now be closer to 800 or 850 millibars in the horizontal, which means we have a relative high and a relative low near the mountains, which means we have a pressure gradient force like this. Coriolis force turns that wind to the right, and what we end up with then is a southerly component to the winds along the spine of the, uh, of the Rocky Mountains, okay? What this does is this helps feed that complex of storms because with more cooling, the further away from the Rocky Mountains uh, that low-level jet will migrate. Also, because we are cooling the Earth's surface at nighttime, we're getting a decoupling of the planetary boundary layer from the free atmosphere. That also provides a nice smooth laminar surface for these uh, wind vectors to flow along. Okay, so it's the development of the low-level jet in conjunction with uh, the 
the heating of the storms that help provide this pressure gradient and help feed these storms and continue in them uh, through the late evening and into the early morning hours. So, again, as long as they maintain a pressure gradient in the mid-level flow and the mid-level flow remains warm and moist, these things should sustain themselves for a while. Here's some statistics from Maddox in 1980. He looked at a number of MCC events and, and came up with some typical numbers. This is from 1978. He suggested there were 43 MCC events. Again, they have to be defined by that satellite imagery. Uh, within those MCC events, there were 17 tornadoes, 22 hail events, 23 wind damage events, and 15 flooding events. And in fact, there were seven deaths that year. In a typical year, there are 25 deaths attributed to storms associated with MCCs and somewhere around 129 injuries uh, as well. Flooding can be a real threat with these storms. All right, let's go back to the overhead camera for one second, and I'll show you what we're talking about here. We've got this you know, well-defined IR cloud shield, right? So we've got our 100,000 kilometer and we've got a 50,000 kilometer cloud shield. Might look something like that. Well, what's going on underneath this? As I said before, this is a multi-cell or a clustering type of an event. What we typically see are we see thunderstorms in their mature stage, thunderstorms in the decay stage, and thunderstorms that are initiating and growing and doing so on that inflow side. Okay, so we're just getting a series or a, or a complex of multi-cells. Maybe we have six, seven, eight, ten types of storms or individual updrafts within that that are all going through various stages of their life from initiation and development or the cumulus stage to the mature stage to the dissipating stage. And with that then, we're getting this enormous cloud shield. So underneath that big cloud shield that I showed you in that IR image are simply individual cells that are somewhat clustered together. Okay, That is the MCC. That is the uh, convective complex that we are talking about. All right. MCCs provide a significant portion of the growing season rainfall for the wheat and corn belts of the Great Plains and the Midwest regions of the United States. Without the development of MCCs, without these clusters of storms, well, I'll show you in a second what type of a percentage of rainfall these things provide. These are great rain producers, as you can imagine. They're reasonably slow moving. Uh, it's a large cluster of thunderstorms that moves across uh, this area, and you typically get a tremendous amount of rainfall from these. Here are the number of MCC events per year from 78 to 99. You can see we reached a high in the mid-80s of 58 events each year in 85 and 86. Our lowest number was 19 back in 81, and again, these are defined by that satellite imagery. But on average, you know, we were somewhere in the upper 30s to low 40s for the number of events, number of MCC events that we get annually. This is the average MCC precipitation percent. In other words, how much of our annual rainfall comes from an, a defined MCC? Well, look at uh, eastern Kansas and parts of Nebraska. We're talking about 8, 9, maybe even 10 percent of the growing or of the average annual uh, precipitation falls from MCCs. Okay, all the way up from northern Texas all the way up almost to the Canadian border, we're talking about somewhere between 3 and 5%. Now, that, that's a significant amount of precipitation um, from MCC activity in this area. If we break that down by spring, uh, March, April, and May, look at how the, per, uh, the percentages go up. In some cases, it's, it's you know 12 or 14% of essentially what is, you know, laying down the groundwork right before you plant or right after you plant in some of these areas, in the wheat belts, uh, corn belt, uh, and so on. And so uh, a high percentage of uh, the precipitation, especially the spring precipitation, comes from MCCs. Summer precipitation, this is the growing season. This is when we're growing the corn, the soybeans, the wheat. Look at these percentages, almost 20%. This is for May, June, July, and August. So the seeds are in the ground, the plants are in the ground, they're trying to grow, 
we are putting out there 20%. So if we have a year in which we get a, a sudden decrease in the number of MCC events, maybe it's cut in half, we don't want to lose you know, almost 10% of our summer precipitation. That could be devastating uh, to the wheat belts, to the corn belts, and so on. And so uh, tremendous amounts of precipitation provided by these, uh, by these MCCs. So again, there's nothing really fancy about MCCs. They're just a large clustering of storms that are defined by IR imagery that get organized, move across the landscape, and usually provide a tremendous amount of precipitation, not a tremendous amount of severe weather, although, unfortunately, there are deaths oftentimes linked to those, sometimes due to uh, flooding, urban types of flooding. All right, let's look at a case study here, and this is from a, a tornado event quite some time ago. This was April 8, 1988, and this was a central Alabama tornado. A couple of things we'll look at here. I'll show you some broad overview of the synoptic scale conditions, literally just looking at where troughs and ridges and those kind of things are. We'll do a quick examination of the mesoscale conditions, uh, look at the evolution and the history of the supercell that produced uh, this tornado, and then we'll look at some of the damage that was produced by this event as well. Synoptic scale conditions, you had, uh, we'll look at the 300 millibar jet stream, uh, 500 millibar vorticity, 850, you had some warm air advection and moisture advection. Uh, we'll look at some features at 1,000 millibars, we kind of use that as a proxy for the surface. Also look at some soundings and associated indices. Take a look at some satellite imagery and the convective outlooks from SPC as well. All right, as I said, this is going to be very broad. We're just looking for kind of pattern recognition here. This was about, oh, I think it was about 20 hours or 22 hours prior uh, to the, uh, the tornado event that took place on April 8th, but this is 0Z, so this is af actually the, the afternoon or evening prior to that event. Um, had a subtropical jet, which seemed pretty active from the southwest. Uh, you can see the height lines there are pretty well uh, tightened up. And a trough beginning to build in the southwest United States. We jump forward 24 hours, and you can see a broad trough at 300 millibars, uh, where the polar jet becomes a little bit more active. Uh, what we have here um, would be the polar jet would be uh, to the north there in this area right through here, subtropical jet coming up in this area right through here. So we're kind of getting the merger of those jets around Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi. Difficult to see, obviously, just using the height lines here without any wind. 500 millibars, obviously, if we're looking for vorticity, one of the things we might want to look at is the shear in terms of shear vorticity, and probably even more importantly would be troughs and curvature vorticity. This would be a, an aid or an uplifting mechanism. Also want to look for troughs for pockets of cool air that may rotate over the area, providing more instability by steepening mid-level lapse rates. Uh, mainly shear vorticity in the general flow. Uh, southwest mid-level flow was providing a layer of dry air aloft. And then uh, by the just around the event time, then you can see a better defined trough, uh, trough axis here. PVA in the central Alabama with added curvature. Uh, trough in the Midwest seemed to be deepening. So here's our trough axis somewhere in here. So we're getting our best positive vorticity associated with that would be out ahead of that northern Mississippi, northern Alabama into central Tennessee. 850 millibars. Uh, what we got here is the height lines. We've also got the red lines indicate uh, temperature. And you can see that we would have generally a warm air advection type of a regime over Mississippi and Alabama at this time period, right? We have a low pressure system sitting over here. Uh, our uh, isotherms are crossing the height lines at almost 90 degrees, so we have pretty strong warm air advection at 850 uh, millibars. And we are seeing the signs of a, of a cold front beginning to develop now we move ahead 24 hours, and you can see here's our, our warm sector here where we're packing those isotherms, uh, colder air back into Mississippi. So we're getting an open wave that is beginning to show up here now at 850 millibars. Center of the low is well up here into western Illinois. Uh, the warm air advection isn't quite as good at this time, but I don't know that it has to be. Uh, so we do have some frontal positions right through here, it appears, and right up in this area as well. So Alabama is certainly in the warm sector of this open wave. 1,000 millibars, uh, surface low is pretty well established. Again, we're just kind of using this as a proxy. 
Uh, and it's located, uh, again, kind of in western Illinois or southern Iowa. Uh, theta E is advecting from the southwest. So the red lines that you see here now are theta E values. Okay, looking at kind of a combination of temperature and moisture. And so we're getting some theta E ridging taking place through Louisiana, Mississippi, and up into northern uh, Alabama, central Tennessee area. Now by the time uh, of the event, look at where that ridge shifts. It shifts off just into the western part of Mississippi. Now here's your surface low, or again, your 1,000 millibar low. Pretty strong warm air advection now at 1,000 millibars. Uh, strong moisture advection, you could imply by the uh, Theta E ridging as well, right up into, uh, again, western Mississippi and central, uh, or I'm sorry, eastern Mississippi and central Alabama. 18Z sounding from that day showed about 1,300 joules per kilogram of Cape. Again, this is early April. This is pretty early in the season. Uh, we're just transitioning now out of the winter season into the, uh, into the spring season here. Storm relative velocity values are somewhat weak, around 55. Um, so you have some cape, not a lot, uh, some shear, not a lot. Uh, but what you do have is pretty good turning of the winds. Uh, you would like to see the low-level wind vector strengthen up a little bit. You'd like your inflow to be a little bit better and probably a little more southerly instead of southwesterly at the surface. Now what happens is our storm relative velocity goes way up because we have taken that surface vector, we have strengthened it, and not only that, we've turned it back to the southeast now. So we're veering our winds, we're backing our surface winds, and we have good veering as you go up through the atmosphere. Also, you get 50 knot winds occurring as low as about 850 millibars in this case. Nice saturated surface through here. Um, not a lot of a cap at this point. Uh, Cape is up over 2,300 joules per kilogram. Storm relative velocity values of 220. So certainly uh, we are now approaching that good tornadic type of an environment if we're only considering those two um, measures. A lot of other things were coming together. Obviously you had the cold front, you had the strong surface low, you had great moisture and warm air advection. Um, you had 500 millibar vorticity that was peaking through there. You had two jets that were coming through there for the evacuation of mass. So you, all things in the atmosphere were lining up in terms of instability and shear. With that, then, SPC went ahead and issued a high risk on this day for mainly northern Alabama and northern Georgia and extreme south-central um, Tennessee, and, in fact, a little bit of eastern Mississippi, northeastern Mississippi as well. So you had an increase in instability ahead of the upper, uh, the, I'm sorry, the mid and upper level troughs and a southwesterly flow. You had mid and upper level winds favorable ahead of the uh, cold front system for supercells. So you had the shear was in place, the instability was coming in, into place, and everything was lining up uh, for what could have been a pretty good event. Looking at the mesoscale, look at some of the surface conditions and the boundaries. Now we don't have, or back in 1998 we didn't have, uh, the type of mesoscale um, models that we see nowadays to help us out. Nevertheless, uh, here is kind of the positioning of the surface front. It's difficult to see there, but it, it creeps right through northwestern Mississippi and then back into the northwestern part of Louisiana. Surface low was pretty wound up at 995 millibars, a deep low. So surface low is in eastern Iowa. You had a developing low in southeast Oklahoma, along the or just west of the uh, the cold frontal boundary, and you had moisture boundary coming up into southern Alabama as well. If you notice, this is at 12Z in the morning. There's a complex of storms down in the southeastern part of Alabama and southwestern Georgia. And what I think probably happened is probably some gust front uh, from that complex or the complex itself just act to help block the flow in that area and actually funnel it back to the west. So we had a much better southerly flow coming up through the western part of Alabama and eastern Mississippi throughout a, a greater portion of the day, probably aided by the convection that was ongoing that morning. By the time night rolls around or that evening rolls around, the cold front now is pushed into the central part of Mississippi. We saw some thunderstorms here, but nothing like what Alabama saw. And the low ejects very rapidly in 12 hours out of eastern Oklahoma and now shoots up into the southern part of Illinois 
and really becomes the dominant low, the 997 low. You can see that low in Iowa kind of becomes cut off. Uh, it's 999, but we had a couple of lows in here. Uh, the surface low reattached itself to the cold front there at 997 coming out of Oklahoma. Difficult to see, but there was a southwest to northeast boundary in South Alabama right along that convective uh, area there where you had dew points of between 68 and 73, if you can imagine that, in early April to the south and 58 to 64 to the north. And so you had a nice boundary uh, stretching out there, moisture boundary, which was advecting northward uh, throughout a good portion of the day. Look at these winds. These are tremendous winds. Uh, we start off here uh, with our, this is the VAD wind profiler from the uh, radar out of Birmingham, Alabama. You can see good turning of the high, good turning of the winds in the low levels and then good speed shear aloft. In fact, you had 120 plus knots in the upper level. So some of these winds here uh, around 120 knots. This is a timeline beginning here moving in this direction to the more recent time. So you had good turning of the winds in the low levels, uh, good speed shear aloft. Again, setting up a favorable shear environment, couple that with some good moisture and warm air advection, and you're in uh, a favorable tornadic type of a situation, especially when you throw out some boundaries. Here was a supercell that created uh, one of the bigger tornadoes on this day. This was just right along, almost right along the Mississippi-Alabama uh, border, just into uh, western Alabama now. This is the supercell here. You can see it's a little bit more messy. These aren't terribly isolated types of supercells, but this is the supercell right through here. A little bit of a representation of a hook echo associated with this strong reflectivity gradient. And if we look over at the velocity panels, here we have our inbound and our outbound uh, Signature. In this case, we are using the radar out of the Columbus Air Force Base in Columbus, Mississippi, which would be in this panel located up in this area here. So, uh, no, I'm sorry, we're not. Um, trying to think where, I guess we're using the Birmingham radar for this one. So we'd have our inbound and our outbound component here. This is uh, Tuscaloosa is right in here. So Birmingham is right up in here. So our inbound and our outbound creating that cyclonic circulation right there. Zoom in on this a little bit closer. Here is uh, clearly a hook echo, V-notch signature associated with this storm. Obviously, this storm is containing a tornado warning at this time when you see uh, a velocity signature that looks like this, where you have the dark reds next to the light greens, indicating that you have very strong uh, cyclonic circulation within that storm. A little bit further in time, storm actually takes on a little bit more of a kidney bean type of a structure where you're getting a tremendous amount of reflectivity, high reflectivity along the back side of that storm. It could be that this storm was producing damage at this time, and that would be one reason that you would get uh, that type of a, a reflectivity signature. Uh, look at all the little cells that are poking out into the inflow area here. It's hard to believe that this storm was able to survive in that type of an environment where you have things blocking the inflow. Nevertheless, Here's a line shot across that storm. If we look across that, we see, again, a very tight reflectivity gradient. I'm sorry, a very tight velocity couplet or velocity gradient right through that area where the tornado should be. This is a really neat image here. This is a three-dimensional look at the shear. Here is your inbound component to your shear and your outbound component to the shear. Very strong three-dimensional shear here. In other words, you have a column of air that is rotating you still see that column of air rotating here with the inbound side and the outbound side just a little bit less strong, but that low-level rotation is really quite strong. And again, this is from the surface up to around 5 kilometers deep in the storm where we have very strong uh, cyclonic uh, turning of the winds, as indicated by the radar. Here's six panels, so we're going up in height. Here's the lowest levels, very tight reflectivity gradient showing up. Still, still, still see it here. Keep tilting up. You can still see it here. Those bright uh, green colors really pop out at you and still showing it here. So a very, very deep column of cyclonic rotation associated uh, with this storm. Here is uh, the reflectivity. Four tilts here. 
interesting. I mean, nice hook echo, obviously. You go up, weak echo region, bounded weak echo region, and that donut hole that we spoke of before. So clear indications. This is not a difficult one to say, well, I wonder if this storm is rotating or not. When you have velocity couplets like that, you know for certain that that storm is strongly rotating. And clearly the reflectivity, the morphology of the storm bears that out. The thing, again, that's interesting to me is look at all these other storms that are trying to interact with that storm. Yet this storm continues to survive even with small storms in its inflow area. It was rated as an F5 tornado. Uh, it actually ended up killing 32 people. There were 258 injured, 608 homes destroyed, uh, a lot of homes with damage, um, about $200 million in property damage, and about $2.2 million in crop damage from that storm. Here's some pictures. This is from Oak Grove, Alabama, <coughs> the next day. Uh, but from that tornado that came through there, Obviously looks like uh, what you would expect F5 damage to look like. Here was a number of cars that were parked along a highway that were thrown down into a ditch, um, obviously rolled along there and, and destroyed. So uh, that was a kind of a simple little case study there where we just looked at some broad synoptic features and some mesoscale features. And again, I don't want you to think, wow, that's easy to figure out what was happening there. That was an easy day. I mean, a lot of ingredients came together. It was probably easy for SPC to issue that high risk. Um, it just looked too classic of a setup. You're not going to see those types of days very often. Uh, most of the time, it's probably going to be, you know, things look pretty good synoptically, but very marginally on the mesoscale, or things look good instability-wise, but not shear-wise, or it looks good shear-wise and not instability-wise. And that's where you really have to hone in on your mesoscale and your local environment in order to find enhanced areas where you think thunderstorms, one, may generate, maybe the genesis point, or two, intensify, where you have a supercell storm, and now you think the probability of it tornadoing is, is increasing because it's nearing some boundary that might be providing more instability. It might be providing a better shear environment or some low-level storm relative helicity. So, um, again, synoptically, you got to look at things. Then you got to look at the mesoscale and the local scale. And even once storms get rolling... Look at what's going on within the storm itself. All right, let's go to a little recap here. Quick little recap. Uh, again, here is the forecasting funnel, and I just got done harping on this, but you know, the, the, the hemispheric scale, the synoptic scale, the mesoscale, they all have some control over what's going to go on, but obviously you can influence things back upward too from those smaller scales. If you remember early on, we talked about three important synoptic scale airstreams. You want a surface southerly or southeasterly flow from the Gulf of Mexico, again, providing synoptic and latent instability. You'd like a capping inversion from 7 to 500 millibars to help seal off that latent and sensible instability to help it build throughout the day. And then you want some jet streak level that's going to help evacuate the mass uh, as well as potentially provide uh, lifting mechanisms at that level as well. We then transitioned into some of the things related to thunderstorms, one of which is being lightning. And the, the concept I introduced to you here was the thermoelectric effect. I want you to think back about that a little bit, where you have these uh, droplets that are carried above the freezing level. They begin to freeze. They come up with a, uh, or they develop their own thermal gradient, and the positive ions tend to migrate toward that cold portion or the outer portion of that droplet. As they do freeze, they collide, they splinter. And a lot of that ice is carried near the top of the storm where the larger part of the droplet remains in the middle part of the storm or the lower part of the storm. And again, you get the separation of charges or this natural battery. And uh, we also talked about hail and hail transport and the squall line. We've got a lot of things going on here. Basically, with the squall line, what I want you to think about is, one, you need a, a linear forcing mechanism. You would like to see some dry air at the mid-levels if you want to see a violent type of a squall line so that you can get some evaporative cooling and help transfer some of that momentum down from the mid-levels to the surface. That's how you're going to get your damaging wind events uh, with this and, and form that line echo wave pattern. Again, here is that image uh, of a, uh, a derecho uh, where you have the updraft coming in, a uh, little shelf right in here main precipitation falling. thing to see here is, that, remember, the radar was sitting over here. So this is your updraft, air moving away from the radar and curving up. And then you also have this sinking green area, air moving toward the radar 
and it's moving in a downward fashion, being carried down by some of that precipitation, and then once it reaches that precipitation core, it's really forced downward to the ground. And again, this is where you transfer some of that mid-level momentum or those stronger winds down to the Earth's surface, and you can begin to cause those damaging wind events. With respect to hail growth, remember you need three things, a strong updraft, one that can support hail, uh, an embryo, something for the hail to grow on, and then the hailstone itself, which, which can grow in terms of either dry growth, spongy growth, or wet growth. And remember, those occur in different levels within the cloud. The dry growth occurs near the top of the cloud where everything is frozen. Spongy growth somewhere uh, in the, the top portion of that mixed layer. And then the wet growth is well within that mixed layer. So you get the growth of both uh, liquid and frozen uh, accretion. Remember, with radar imagery and hail, you can get the three-body scatter spike, which is simply large hailstones or large reflectivities uh, that uh, you have a wet hailstone, the pulse hits that, it's reflected down to the ground, back to the hailstone, and back to the radar, which provides us that flare or that spike that comes out of the back of the storm. So when you see that, and again, you oftentimes have to tilt up through various levels of the radar in order to see that, that's a great indication that that storm contains hail, at least at the mid-levels. Now, depending upon your uh, wet bulb zero height, a lot of that hail may melt before it even gets to the ground. Uh, and so, But nevertheless, it's a good indicator that the storm contains hail within the storm, at least within the mid-levels of the storm. With respect to supercells, remember we spoke about the Lemon and Doswell model, and they talk about the divided mesocyclone, the rear flank downdraft working its way down to the ground, and between that divided mesocyclone, you get that tornadic vortex signature, which stretches downward to the ground. Remember, Klemp is very similar in his concepts, except suggests that low-level rotation is caused by the ingestion of uh, low-level helicity that is tilted upward. Again, a lot of the newer research, even though these models came out in the mid-'70s and, and early-'80s, uh, suggests that both are probably correct in what's important in supercells. The rear flank downdraft is quite important. The ingestion of horizontal vorticity is probably quite important. If you remember, we talked about that ingestion and we talked about some of the things from Project Vortex where they found boundaries near almost all of the tornadic storms that they investigated out in the Great Plains. Here was an example where you had a baroclinic zone uh, that was associated with outflow, and you had a thunderstorm that was not rotating, but as soon as it intersected that baroclinic area, it ingested that horizontal vorticity and briefly increased uh, or became, uh, had some mesocyclone or, or began to rotate. Uh, and so it's the, it appears that the boundary layer and the low levels and, and what's at the Earth's surface may dictate whether or not storms can actually tornado. Uh, here's another one. Remember the anvil shadow where you get a differential heating zone. You get a circulation very similar to a sea breeze front that sets up. And in this case, the thunderstorm tracked right along that boundary and ingested that horizontal vorticity, tilted it in the vertical, stretched it, and became uh, a strongly rotating storm for a period of time. With respect to supercells, remember we talked about the classic, the LPs, and the HPs. And generally speaking, the physics or the kinematics within a supercell are very similar to one another except the environments that they form in dictate what type of a morphology they would take on. And obviously some of that morphology or where precipitation and heavy areas of precipitation versus light areas of precipitation are located will make some determination on the tornadic potential of each of these storms. Here again is just the classic cartoon, uh, your forward flank area, your updraft base, your rear flank downdraft, oftentimes associated with a new line of convection known as the flanking line, the anvil, the overshooting top, and so on. I think you should be well-versed in that by now. Then we got into tornadoes, and we talked about the average number of tornadoes, and we talked about tornado climatologies, and we talked about the life cycle of a tornado from the dust whirl stage through its mature stage where it can form multiple vortices all the way to the decay and the rope stages. And so... Um, a lot of information was given to you in that lecture, especially about the climatology and about the impact of tornadoes related to uh, housing structures, specifically mobile homes. Talked about the Julian dates. It's interesting that we get such a, a strong late season maximum down here in the south, and then you see much more pronounced spring and then uh, mid and late summer as you transition north out of the deep south uh, with respect to when you should see or your highest probability 
of seeing tornadoes based solely upon date. So what's up next for you? Two more lectures, lectures number 11 and 12, that are going to deal with tropical systems and hurricanes. These are going to be presented by one of my old students, Justin Jackson, one of the smartest guys uh, I know. He is a, uh, a pretty good guy when it comes to severe storms and a pretty good guy when it comes to tropical systems and hurricanes as well. So I think you're going to enjoy having him for the last two lectures in this series. It's been a pleasure being with you for the first 10. I hope you got something from this. Again, I would reiterate that the, the atmosphere or what we know about the atmosphere and things like models are continuously changing. What you got from this course is probably going to be outdated relatively soon. You have to keep up with the changes that are taking place. Get a hold of some of the AMS journals. Read some of the literature. Some of those journals like Weather and Forecasting are fantastic for helping you keep up with the latest research and what's going on uh, with not just severe storms but all aspects of the weather. And so this is not something that when you complete this course or when you complete this program that you can sit back and say, okay, well, now I know what I need to know about the, the weather. That's simply not the case. I've held my Ph.D. now for about seven years, and things have changed so much in that seven-year time period. It's amazing to me to think about what I came into this profession knowing and what I know now and how it's different, I guess, is what's most important. So things are always changing. I want you to keep that in mind. I don't want you to sit back when you're done with this course or certainly when you're done with this program and think that you now know enough. It's always going to change. There's going to be new models. There's going to be new data. There's going to be new information and new research that you have to keep up with. So enjoy your last two lectures. Like I said, it's been a pleasure being with you for the first 10. Hope you got something from this, and I'll probably see you when you come uh, for the workshop that will be held at the end of your program of study. See you soon.